Mayor of Sherbrooke takes indefinite medical leave. 17 MPs' offices were occupied yesterday demanding action to stop the violence in Palestine. Jamaican officials decry the living and working conditions of temporary foreign workers in Canada. Man facing the death penalty in Egypt is scheduled to be deported back there tomorrow. And Quebec's Association of First Nations and Inuit Police Chiefs is taking the federal government to court over underfunding. Good morning. It's Tuesday, October 31st. That's right. It is Halloween. I am definitely not dressed up. Here are your headlines. This morning, for an all-Canadian lineup of news, we start in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Rémi Léonard from La Tribune is reporting that Evelyn Baudouin, the mayor of Sherbrooke, is taking a forced leave of absence as mayor, as directed by her doctor. The leave is for an indeterminate amount of time, but Baudouin says she hopes it isn't going to be very long. Quote, I want to avoid that it becomes too difficult to get over, unquote. She wrote in a letter explaining her absence and said that she's not going to be giving people the reason for why she's taking the leave. She appointed Raïs Kibange to be the acting mayor. I note this story today because Baudouin is pretty young. She was just 32 when she was elected in 2021, and her absence is a reminder of the stress that politics can bring to someone. Regardless of whether or not this leave is related to her job, having a high-profile position, especially as a younger woman, can make it even harder for someone to step back and take care of themselves, and it certainly also can ramp up the attacks that one experiences. Now, there's another part of the story that you should be paying attention to, because it's also interesting, is the role that Kibanj is going to be playing. He is someone to watch. He's 39. He's the first black councillor in the city of Sherbrooke to be elected, and Therefore, near certainly the first black acting mayor. He came to Canada when he was 20 years old as a refugee from Congo. He lived in Yugoslavia and Belgium before he came to Canada through the Family Unification Program to join other family members. They settled first in Calgary, but as reported by Radio-Canada Estrie, love brought him to Sherbrooke, where he ended up going to college, university, settled, and is now the acting mayor. Next, local members of Parliament had their offices occupied yesterday in cities all over Canada. Did you miss the news? Well, there were some articles, but not many considering how big the action was, and I didn't see anything at all from a national perspective. But from the Montreal Gazette, 17 MP offices in 12 cities were occupied, calling for a ceasefire in Palestine. In Montreal, protesters hit liberals Melanie Jolie, David Lametti, and Rachel Bendayan's offices. In Montreal and elsewhere, activists read the names of Palestinians who have been killed in the last three weeks. Actions specifically targeted MPs who did not sign a letter calling for a ceasefire. That letter was signed by 33 MPs, including, as the Gazette notes, 23 liberals. In many locations, the activists were cleared out by police. Next, Canada had a visit by Jamaican officials last week. They went to several Ontario farms after migrant workers said in an open letter that they were required to work, quote, like animals, unquote, at Ontario farms. This news was reported by CTV News' Hannah Alberga. Labour Minister Purnell Charles Jr. visited more than 10 farms last week, chosen for being notable thanks to previous reports of problems noted by workers. While the writers of the letter didn't identify which farms they worked at, they were all from Brantford, Ontario, and at least one of them works at Komiensky Farms. This farm was part of Charles's visit. One worker who works at this farm told CTV News this, quote, These bosses, they think of Jamaicans overall. They think of us as some type of a slave, the way they talk to us, the way they greet us, unquote. The farm owners didn't respond to CTV News' request for comment. The letter detailed bed bug infestations and problems with workers accessing bathroom breaks. These issues have been long identified, including last year, when workers called the program systemic slavery. Canada's Minister of Labour, Randy Boissonneau, said that quote-unquote bad actors will be found and be forced to quote, pay the price, unquote, for abuse. 
Nice words, but man, Canadians will believe that when we see it because you folks have not actually done anything to significantly improve these kinds of conditions. Remember how much we knew about the terrible working conditions and living conditions during the early days of the pandemic? In the open letter, the workers say this, quote, We have left our children, spouses, parents, siblings, friends, and other loved ones to come here. We came to this country to get better. We came for more than this low-paying job. We should have the ability to work in a place that treats us with respect. We are no different than the generations of migrant workers that came before us. Next, news from Laura Osman at the Canadian Press about Dr. Ezat Gouda, a man who had his refugee claim denied and who faces the death penalty in Egypt. He says he's been politically targeted for his activities after the Arab Spring. He was found guilty in absentia related to two demonstrations that became violent in 2013. Gouda was a founding member of the Freedom and Justice Party, which was affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. That became a problem when the elected government was overthrown by a military coup. Gouda became a target of the new government. Gouda is retired, but he used to be an obstetrician. His deportation order is set for November 1st, which is, of course, tomorrow. He was shocked that he received a deportation order and that the Canadian government did not accept his refugee claim. He submitted all the documents that he had and demonstrated his life would be in danger if he's sent back to Egypt. Canadian immigration officials thought that this documentation was, quote, too vague and insufficient, unquote, for his claim to be accepted. Gouda has lost two sons to state violence, both killed at different times protesting against the government. His wife and two other children were hoping to join Gouda in Canada, but their assets have been seized and their passports have been confiscated. Gouda entered Canada in 2002 after leaving the United States because of rising hatred towards Muslims there. He arrived in Canada through Roxham Road. Five other people from the same party he founded, Freedom and Justice Party, have sought refugee status in Canada and each of them risks being removed by immigration services. Canada does not recognize the Freedom and Justice Party as a hostile entity or a threat. And finally, the Association of Inuit and First Nations Chiefs of Police of Quebec have brought the federal government to the Human Rights Tribunal over the systemic underfunding of their police services. This story, reported by Pascal Robida from Radio-Canada, reports that the decision to take this action was unanimous among the 22 Indigenous police forces. Sean DeLude, president of the group, said this, quote, According to our agreements with Public Security Canada, we're mandated to offer equivalent services as those offered to the general population. Unfortunately, the financing and conditions don't allow us to reach that level, unquote. This results in solo patrols at night with officers when they should be in pairs. There's a lack of equipment like bulletproof vests and salary makes it hard to keep the best recruits. Quote, there is no police union that would accept wearing expired bulletproof vests while on patrol. Why do we have to accept this? Asked Delude. The chiefs of police say that lack of adequate services has a devastating impact on the development and health of Indigenous people in Quebec and Canada. They aren't able to address gender-based violence and alcoholism in some communities. There are also growing problems with contraband and organized crime. The Liberals promised to fix this funding gap, but they have not yet done it. The Indigenous Policing Program was created in 1991 that mandated the creation of agreements between governments and 60% of First Nations and Inuit communities in Canada. The feds contribute 52% of the funding of the program and the provinces and territories pay the rest. When Robida contacted the provincial government, they said that they couldn't comment on it as there was ongoing court proceedings. Those are your headlines for Tuesday, October 31st. I hope that you're going to have a great Halloween day. And today is San Yonora Day. You know what? In today's episode, there's a, there's a mention of how we need to occupy offices of members of parliament. And of course, that happened yesterday. Now, we recorded it on Sunday, so you'll have to forgive me for not mentioning what was happening the day after. But the episode is really good. I know you're going to like it. Make sure you listen for it, which drops in a couple of hours around noon today. You are listening to this podcast at sandyandnora.com, on the Real News Network podcast feed, and anywhere you get your podcasts.